to me, education is a basic human right. So last fall, uh, we started an experiment at Stanford where we took my class that I co-teach with another professor, Peter Norvik, online. And in no time, more than 100,000 students signed up. When that happened, uh, we knew that we had come a a across an education model that really resonated with students worldwide. Almost all my students prefer the online version over the in-class version. And the reason is, if I have 200 students in my class, I, I can be very interactive but not with all 200 students. Having me pre-canned in an interactive online medium ended up being much more attractive than seeing me in class. The form, I think, is a lot better because obviously you can like fast forward, rewind, and it's not like a one size fit all. If you're mo a really motivated student, you can go as far as you want to go. I think it's really liberating when you go at your own pace. If you want to ask your friend a question, you can do it. You can pause the teacher. There's not kind of like the distraction of them being there in front of a whiteboard and kind of like looking down at you like, do you get this? Traditionally, often online education, video-based education meant you would videotape the professor. And the professor is used to classroom lectures and classroom interaction. You capture this with the camera. I don't think they really kind of get it. It's really not like a vibrant community trying to help you learn. I mean, the only difference is that you're not getting a lecture in a physical building. In class, I would lecture and say, here's a concept explaining to you. In our online world, I do exactly the opposite. I say, okay, student, here's a problem, solve it. I toss the problem back into the core of the student. And the nice thing about the digital world is the video now stops, there could be a quiz, there could be some programming thing set up where they write program code. And only as they really try to solve it, do I have a pre-recorded explanation of how I would solve the problem. hundred years ago, uh, we invented celluloid. And there was a method by which acting could scale, which means a single performance could make it to now hundreds of millions of, of, of people. And what happened in that field is that people first just re recorded the stage play. And then after years, they realized, wow, that you, can, you can do much more with it. You can have special effects, you can have stuntmen, you can uh, re-record a scene if it didn't work and so on. And modern cinematography was invented. So I feel if we get stuck with this model of just recording the professor, we get stuck uh, by using technology to not to its fullest potential. I think we have to invent what's the equivalent of cinematography. So rather than seeing a professor lecturing... Six plus two is a... Our concept is all focused around quizzes. So your goal is to define a Python procedure. And then you solve it. And if you manage to solve it, you can feel proud of yourself. If you get stuck, then we have pre-recorded videos that help you to solve the problem. Here's one way to define print numbers. Our objective is that you, the student, really learn how to solve a problem and acquire a new skill. If you can eliminate three teachers and have everything move online, that's going to be uh, more efficient from a, from a purely economic perspective. However, I don't think it's advisable from an educational perspective. Something like 400 years ago, in Europe, 96% of the population worked in agriculture as farmers. And today, we have less than 2%. And yes, you got commiserate that 94% of us kind of moved from farming jobs to something else, but I think we are so much better off. In terms of teachers, I think there's going to be, I think there will be adjustments be made. Uh, we will make the education by and large more economical and better. So I hope uh, that the fact that now things are more economical and better will lift up everybody. For example, I envision that really good teachers will be able to reach many more students than today. Um, I used to teach 200 students and it would never happen that someone stopped me on the street and say, hey, Professor Thwan, I know you. Now routinely I go to any place in the world and people, I mean, at least like once a week or so, someone comes up to me and say, hey, I know you from class. You can make teaching a first class discipline again. So maybe it'll be the, the, the role of the teacher will change more as um, an assistant in the process, which actually I think is what good teaching is all about anyway. Um, it's not necessarily about the delivery of the content, but it's about engaging students and helping them, you know, self-engage in, in the material. So at Stanford there's a very popular professor who teaches more students in his class that fit into the largest auditorium. So he teaches the same class twice the same week, the exact same lecture yeah. twice. Then year in, year out, he's going to teach the same class essentially again and again. However, I don't think it's advisable from an educational perspective. Students need interaction. Well, the thing about a classroom is you're forcing a bunch of students to sit together for two hours and the, the students are not allowed to 
you know, talk to one another and are not allowed to ask questions of one another. I think a lot of people actually underestimate how powerful interaction can be online. Collaboration is really important in the classroom and I don't think that you, you, people have to compromise on that. If you're taking an online class now in like Udacity or Coursera, there's a forum that you can post questions on and you can post it anonymously. So even if it's like a really kind of like controversial idea or something that you, you think maybe this is stupid, you just post it anonymously and people will, you know, respond to you. And it's, and it's not like no one's going to respond since there's like a thousand people up there. The exams were significantly harder than I'd ever passed an exam, an exam at Stanford. And the scores were interesting. Usually my average score would be about 70% for an easy exam. Now, having the online version made in a harder exam, the score go to about 90% on average. And in the internet population, 80%. 80 so I, I have, I, in this one data point, I think the interactive student-driven, problem-driven way of teaching seems to get much, much better learning results than the lecturing. But I also believe that education will become more of a lifelong issue. I think the idea of having a, a one-time slice of your life where you get your entire job level in higher education is kind of a myth this time and age. It goes back to the times of your grandparents that I'm sure had just one job during their entire life. But now people have multiple jobs, technology moves on, society moves on much faster pace, people live longer. So as a result, I think the idea of like lifelong education is going to be more and more important. And as a result, we won't be able to find ourselves on campuses as much as in the, in the past. And we've promised the world there'll always be a free path through our education. So people want to educate themselves, they can get it for free. And when you compare that to the cost of taking a class at Stanford, where the class is $3,000, um, you know, even, even if our costs go up considerably, they're still uh, uh, so we're several orders of magnitude cheaper. And referrals of talent is typically associated with giving money to the referring institution. We have several hundred thousand students in our system, and many of them are amazing. Uh, so we've already placed some of them in jobs, and we hope to monetize, as a technical term, hope to make money off the placement of students. Most of the students that we reach at Udacity don't make it into Stanford classes. The, the current system is very exclusive. If you make it in, that's great. But what if you're in mid-career and you have a mortgage and you're raising two children and you can't really make it into Stanford? Or what if you're not admitted, right? What's your second chance? What if you live in a developing country and there's just no way for you to get into a top uh, university. If I look at my education impact in terms of numbers of students compared to my regular teachings at Stanford, I certainly had more than a hundred times as many, or a thousand times as many students than I have normally have in a class. At the time we, we did the tally, uh, 210 online students had 100% and zero Stanford students. At the end of a course, we looked at the total score in, in, this, in the same exams and, and same homework questions and the top 412 or so students were all online students and the top performing Stanford students were number 413. Um, so there's certainly a number of students in the world, we just took the top students, that compare favorably with Stanford students who are currently not in the Stanford system. And what we do here is I think we have a system set up that takes really the best of the best, but by far not all of them. And that system doesn't give the other people a real second chance. So what we find is there's so many fantastic, amazing people out there that do really well in these online classes, uh, that do get a second chance now.